Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Triangulation, episode 358, recorded Friday, July 20th, 2018, for airing August 3rd, 2018. General Magic, the movie. It's time for Triangulation, the show where we get together with some of the most interesting people in technology. We're going to have, this is going to be uh, a little trip back in time to what uh, John Scully called uh, the best company, the most important company in Silicon Valley nobody's ever heard of. It's General Magic. Now, some of you have heard of it, but you're going to know a lot more about it after you meet our guest, Sarah Karush is here and Matt Maud. They're uh, the directors of a brand new documentary just premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival called General Magic. It's the movie about this company that nobody ever heard of. Welcome. It's great to have you on Thank Triangulation. You. Thank you for having us. You worked at Triangulation, Sarah. I Not at no. uh, uh, General Magic. She yeah. just I'd got. Like to. She just got. Here. I could. She work just at... got here. You, you haven't yet started working here. <laughs> no, you worked at General Magic. I did. Is work that at what? General Magic. Is it? Was it your idea to to, to do this movie? It wasn't my idea, um, but it was a long time in coming. It was twenty years in coming because I filmed at the company twenty years ago, and at the time they were just kids and geeks, and they were certainly doing interesting things. Yeah. But it wasn't until years later that I realized the enormity of the talent and the amazing things that the people at General Magic had gone on to do. And, you know, it, it was that um, combined with the tragic death of one of the magicians that made me think, oh, it's time it's to time. tell the story. Yeah. So I guess when you mention General Magic, that's probably the first thing you say when you're trying to explain why you wanted to do this movie is, well, look who worked there. Mm -hmm. Who worked at General Magic? Well, I think, you know, when you think about, essentially, just to take a step back, you know, the, the film essentially and the story tells um, the tale of this group of young magicians who were trying to build what essentially was the first smartphone. Right. And so... And this is a uh, time frame uh, about 1991. Yeah, 1992, 93, 94, okay. 95. And, I mean, they, the, the kind of, the idea was first concepted in 1989. Out of Apple. Yes. I mean, uh, yeah. I guess the seed of this is planted by the by Andy Hertzfeld and, and, and Bill Atkinson, who are the creators of the Macintosh. And they were and, and you talk about this in the movie for five years looking for something as important to as, do. As yeah. the Macintosh. And meanwhile you have Mark Pratt at the Aspen Institute who has this vision of the future, which is essentially the future that we live in today, where these small devices that we take everywhere that we use for everything and that keep us constantly connected. And that really was his vision. Um, but out of General Magic, you know, came two of the most influential instrumental people in in the development of the smartphone, Andy Rubin, Android, Tony Fidel, who was a co inventor of iPod and then iPhone. Um, but there were many others too, like John G. Andrea, who's now head of AI at Apple, formerly of Google. Megan Smith, who went to, on to be the chief technology officer for Obama, the United States. Um, it's just so many people. Pierre, Pierre eBay. Omidyar, who's done Pierre Omidyar, who was a, a tech, a, like a customer support tech. <laughs> yep. He was a developer. And he yeah. said, support, yeah. we should... We should, I love this part of the movie. We should, uh, I have this idea, we could do like an auction site and everybody go, oh no, that's like a garage sale. Nobody would want to do that. Why would you trust anybody on the internet? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not going to work. <laughs> and he had a desk where he'd had all these checks piling up and, you know, Dee, who's in the movie, would go by and say, hey, Pierre, what is all that stuff on your desk? And he said, oh, it's these checks, this little thing I'm starting. And oh, so that funny. went on to be eBay. So really, just extraordinary people came from there. Why was it? What was it about General Magic? that attracted these people? I think they did see the future. I think, you know, Mark's vision um, mm. was correct and they tasted and saw the future and they and it was one of the best tech teams ever in history. Mm. And, you know, despite the fact they failed spectacularly, th there were so many developments that came out of there, you know, whether it's the touch screen or the um, software modem, <coughs> the um, USB. I mean, so many of the things we take for granted actually were developed. Emojis. I mean, there's a scene in the movie where you see them actually starting. Susan Kerr, who was, you know, obviously designed all the graphics for the Mac and is really, I think, the most influential designer of our mm. age. Not enough people know about Susan, but she, she was coming up with these beautiful little animated emojis. So, so much. It was just this incredibly creative, vibrant community with this astonishing talent at this, um, this particular moment in time. And then, you know, somebody, Amy said, it's a supernova. And then this talent 
was <sighs> was spread throughout the valley and the yeah. world and has changed life as we know it. I think as well, if you're if you're a young engineer and you have the ability to work with your heroes, you know, because Andy Hertzfeld and Bill Atkinson and Susan Kerr and Joanna Hoffman working on the Macintosh, you know, that the means to be able to work with those caliber of people as a 20 something year old, that was the draw, that was the attraction. And then when it's coupled with this vision that was insanely ambitious, I think that's why so many engineers just kind of flocked to the company. But Tony also- Fidel's story is amazing. <laughs> yeah. You talk about how he just, he came from Michigan, he was from Detroit. Yeah. He had no, he was just a kid. He yeah. was just a kid. I mean, literally a kid. And he um, and his big thing was Mac Week. So every week he'd get it and he'd look and he'd read, you know, here's Joanna and Andy and Bill and they're going to go off and do something and could I work with them? And no one's shown the tenacity that he did. I mean, he literally... Yeah, he slept on the doorstep. He literally yeah. slept on the doorstep and then kept calling and kept calling until basically he wore them down and they offered him a job. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> like a job interview by attrition. It's like, <laughs> and, you, yeah. and the first thing they do is they strip off his tie and they take off his jacket and say, yeah. we don't dress like that around, yeah. <laughs> around here. Yeah, so. it's a very sweet coming of age story. But it is a classic hero's journey. You know, you have um, these young kids who come and they go on this quest and they meet lots of dragons and foes and yeah. challenges and they're brought to their knees and then out of that comes this amazing redemption and story of um, perseverance and as I said went on to just affect it you know there isn't a person at least in our vicinity that hasn't been affected by their work there's a moment in the movie where Mark Porat brings out his giant red book because he's been I, I gather thinking about this for a really long time mm-hmm. and he's basically mm-hmm. sketched out every conceivable scenario that you'd want to do with mm-hmm. a portable communication mm-hmm. device and it's the book and you look at it and this is before the Newton came out and mm-hmm. you look at it and you say that's the smartphone he's yeah. designed a smartphone well it wasn't just the the he'd sort of done the hardware parts of it because I mean if you look at the diagram it is identical to an iPhone 5 or an iPhone yeah. 6 but it was also uh, you know the app culture that went into it the idea of online shopping but also um, he'd, he'd written that you, you wouldn't communicate through um, your, your name on an address book you would use something called the face space and that you would have the an face icon space, the all face right? space yeah. yeah and that you would have you know an avatar or, or later that would become a photograph. <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg's eight years old. They're coming. Yeah, no, I mean, it's just. Yeah. I, I remember reading that and just being like, uh-huh. "Oh my god!" I mean, you know, it's 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 not just you know part of the future. It is the entire future. And I think there's this there's the scene in in the film where Joanna Hoffman is 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 looking through the book and she 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 she'd forgotten like how uh, you know full the vision was because it it wasn't just the diagram. It was it was it was every single part. Of what makes that's it a very phone moving uh, moment. That's contemporary. That bit. Yes. Of, mm-hmm. Yeah. Where did you get the book? Well, uh, Mark still has the book, and he very kindly lent it to us, which l- lends me, leads me to the question: Did you bring it? No. I just <laughs> remembered it's Why didn't you bring it? I would die to look at that thing. Mark, the, I will. I will get it. It's, it's at the office. Huh, I know Mark, where it is, he's but lost I it. Did not bring it. <laughs> and Mark, no. <laughs> your, your, your spell book when you saw yeah. the future has, has disappeared. That book. Is I mean that has to go to the Smithsonian. That has to go to the Computer History it's Museum. It's going well. We think it's going to go to the Computer History Museum. Yeah. We've said that we'll donate all of our footage to the History Museum. We Good. just completely spoke for Mark there. We were just like, oh, Mark, yeah, Mark. It's Mark's do- book. Yeah, it's Mark's book. But, well, but yeah. that's an interesting story because of all these people, he's the name that's least known in history. You know, you don't associate. Uh, uh, you know, he went on to do uh, building stuff, solar, and mm-hmm. uh, he's not known in Silicon Valley anymore. We hope he will be now. Yeah, you uh, did a good job, I think, of resurrecting. I hope so, because I think he's an extraordinary, extraordinary visionary. And um, I think, you know, when you suffer and go through something, is you know, people talk about failure in a way that's, uh, you know, it's 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 disgust. It's almost... Um, it's, it's not rose-tinted. It's, 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 it's gold-plated. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, you and, have to fail in Silicon yeah. Valley. That's... You, you know, that's part of your resume. If and you haven't failed, we don't want you. And it's part of the culture. But, yeah. but the reality of failure is brutal. You know, when you go through losing a company like that, or and you, and you know what it takes. I mean, you know the work it takes, oh, the, the hours blood, that it sweat, takes, the, the buzzer. Tears. And when, you, when it fails, um, I think, you know, we hear about the success stories. We don't hear about the people who are truly broken. Mm, yeah. And I think there were some people at General Magic who never recovered. He lost everything. Yes. He lost his family. Yes. He, he lost yes. everything uh, yeah. doing this. And I think, I think it is harder for founders because, you know, you have to, uh, you know, you have to 
there's a, there's a time, say, if the company's struggling, it's not one of those where it's like a light bulb switches off and it, it just stops. I think for what General Magic did, in which it was trying, it tried to keep on iterating and it, and it tried to keep on clawing, you know, parts of the vision and then articulating it. I think it's harder then for a founder to kind of jump onto the next thing. Um, and, and I think that's what was hard for Mark. It, it, there wasn't like, oh, I can, I'll stop this and then I'll take this and then start working on the next thing in the way that, say, an Andy Rubin was or, or a Tony Fidel was able yeah. to do. Well, they were younger too. Yeah. So this was their first, for most of totally. them, this was their first job. Yeah. And what a great first job, right? You come out yeah. of that and, and you've been inspired. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting because the people who from who came from Apple, who for whom it wasn't their first, it was to some in some respects their last job. It was kind of their swan song. I know Andy went on to do Easel, which didn't also didn't really go anywhere. And he's it, there's a very touching mo moment in the movie where you have Andy Hertzfeld now older, uh, walking through the Computer History Museum, and he's saying uh, he's looking at all the things that he yeah. invented, the Lisa and the yeah. Macintosh and and the general magic that and and uh he says it makes me feel old i love that scene it's so poignant andy is an amazing man i mean Isn't we, we, we mm -hmm. all, I, I love andy hertzfeld and we know him as an incredible yeah. inventor one of the greats um but i think his willingness to really look at what didn't work was so brave and um so honest and raw but it, it takes a very special person to be yeah. able to do that, I think. Yeah, to own that. To own the mistakes. But the thing that's great about Andy uh, is, you know, when you say it, it was their swan song, uh, he may not have had, say, the next impact of, say, an Andy Rubin or a Tony Fidel, but Andy is a part of those successes. And, and oh, not just, not just in the... To in, me, it was the, it was the passing of the yes, torch. It's absolutely. not just the baton. I think it's also that, you know, Andy sees... Tony Fidel like two or three they times still a still you know there's still that yeah, idea of, of coming to Andy and saying nice. what do you think about this you yes. know he he is this kind of mentor yes. to so many yes. people he is so available yeah. and you know I think that's one of the things that's so incredible about Andy and Joanna you know oh, yeah. there's so many people at General Magic that are like that Joanna that they are Hoffman, part of the family the marketing director for the Macintosh yeah. you see her in that horrific movie <laughs> The Jobs movie, uh, she's the kind of the German accented uh, woman in the yeah. job. It's totally misportrayed. It's very sad. And, yeah. uh, so, and Kate Winslet talking about ironing Steve Jobs' shirt. And <sighs> Joanna's son famously said to her, having seen the movie, Mom, you never ironed his shirts, no. did you? And she was like, of course I did. But the weirdest thing about that was like putting like a love interest into that story. Yeah. And just like, just so this is the antidote for that, <clears> which is which is great. And it's not about Steve Jobs at all, although, although peripherally he, it is, isn't it? I well, guess. I think, yes, so you raised an interesting point, but I think Steve plays a very important role in the movie. One is, you know, he was the original prophet and then yeah. he goes into the wilderness. Yeah. You know, his disciples go off and try and do this new thing. But it's only when those two forces come together again at Apple that then we get what we get today. And I love that part of the story. And I don't think everybody necessarily knows is it, but for me, um, I, I love that. I did. And of course, you, you do it, it, you did a very nice thing, which is bring Andy Hertzfeld and Joanna Hoffman back to the theater where Macintosh was introduced. And it's an empty theater now, and, and they're standing there. And actually, Apple's gone back to it and starts, it's just started using it again. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, they, not for long because now they have their own campus, but yep. for a couple of years, they were using it. And, uh, you immediately see the ghost of Steve Jobs. And I, no disrespect to Mark Porat, but this is what I got from uh, General Magic, the movie. And by the way, we're talking to the directors, the creators. I should, we should just say the creators of the, of the movie, uh, Matt Maud and, uh, and I'm, I'm terrible with names. Sarah, Sarah Karush. I want to say it right. Karush. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay. Um, uh, <clears throat> is that what you really, what I got out of it was you can have the same talent and the same team as that as Jobs had during the Macintosh, but you need somebody to crack the whip to say, "Good artist ship," mm -hmm. uh, to get the guys to do it. You need a visionary who's not necessarily a technical visionary. Mark Porat had the dream, had the vision, and there were people at Apple like Mark Porat who had the dream of the Macintosh, mm -hmm. but it wasn't them who made the Macintosh. It was Steve Jobs who said to the team, "You're going to make something," yeah. and I think. And correct me if I'm wrong, but that was what I, the lesson I got out of General Magic. The one thing they lacked was a Steve Jobs. And I, well, in a very particular aspect of Steve. So definitely Mark had the visionary aspect of Steve. Absolutely. But the execution piece of Steve, he didn't have, at least to anywhere near the same degree. But but I think, you know, this is what I'm seeing in this next generation. So Tony Fidel has, is an ex 
extraordinary. I, I mean, to me, he is he is the, the great product guy of our age because he's his willingness and his ability to execute and to keep, you know, he has this thing where he breaks, something's not working and he'll break it down and he'll start again and build again and relentless pursuit of perfection and getting it right and understanding what's not working. Um, I think it's an extremely rare quality that you have both. But he struggled at Nest and eventually was mm. ousted because he couldn't deliver a product. Again, there's that <laughs> one extra little thing you need. I would you know that's interesting you say that. I that's my, one of my great greatest experiences, product experiences is putting my nest on the wall and it I was a pure nest. delight. Loved it. But mm. but the reason I'm I, you know he was the vision guy. There's no question about it. But Nest struggled after it was acquired to deliver the next thing. And they and it was something that happened at General Magic too, which is the the reluctance of the the people who are creating this thing to let it go to put it out in the real world. Yeah. It's our baby and we're not done. It's not perfect. I want to do one more thing. And I think that that N Tony might have suffered from that at Nest. At least that was the knock on him. And that's from the outside. You know I him much think, better. Uh, yeah, well that's not my impression. I think Good. there were other forces at work. Well, there might have been, um yeah. I, I, you know that's but I but you're right in terms of, you know, th those people who who execute and have the vision and can do both are, are really really rare. And yeah. Steve Jobs was It gives you know, it uh, it was it's so funny because even though he's not a presence in the movie he is because the lesson I got out of the movie was how rare somebody like Steve Jobs is and you can have all yeah. the other pieces of the puzzle but missing that one mm -hmm. person. Yeah, you miss that hammer. You need a hammer. You need a guy that comes around with a hammer. Yeah. But also, I think, um, you know, the great lesson for me, I'm not a technologist and I'm not particularly interested in technology, but what I found really interesting about the story was is that you, if you look at um, where the Magic Cap device failed and then compare it to the iPod Genesis, that the first iPod, you know, was amazing for its time, but a year later, you know, it, it felt like an archaic, ar you know, an archaic product you know it was every single year they you point iterated, that out in the movie. iterated and iterated the, 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 with magic link they were trying to get it all at once perfection they were biting off too big yeah. a chunk and maybe tony learned that there because yeah. the, what apple did with the ipod is they iterated every year and you say oh, this yes. in the movie yeah definitely. and they didn't try to get it all in the first generation yeah. they knew it could be better but mm -hmm. we're no we're going to ship this one and then we're going to add more and then add more yeah. and then add more and sometimes for people on the outside people like us covering it it feels like apple's holding back like oh yeah they want to have a product next year they want a product the year after but you made a very good case a very strong case that it's important to let the product evolve over time instead of trying to get it right perfect the first and also time. the customer needs to take time to actually go okay i can use this and I understand it yeah. and I'm an expert now so that when the next iteration comes they're using that same right. knowledge to take that jump forward you know the idea that the iPhone is, is just a combination of your iPod and your email and an app world all bundled into one right. you know you, you've used your phone and you used your iPod and putting them together means that everybody can just use it right. straight away if you gave that to someone in 1995, they'd look at it and go, "What do I do?" And you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't use it. So it, it becomes you have to take the baby step. The single hardest thing to do in technology is introduce a new category because people don't know what to do with it. They don't know where it works. They don't know how it fits. And one of the things Steve Jobs was also <coughs> good at was telling a story. And, oh, and yes. you know, he's a marketing master. And the yeah. and the, the ability to tell the story so that people understand, oh, this is what I, this is the vision. This is what I yeah. can do with it. And that also was a little lacking. I want to we're gonna take a break and come back. Sarah Karush is here, Matt Maud, they are the creators of a movie. When can people see this? Because you really want to see this. Where is it gonna be? Well, we uh, we've had a lot of interest from distributors. We haven't finally decided where it's gonna end up, but we're having the Silicon Valley premiere this week. Next Thursday. Next where? Thursday. Um, in San Jose, please come. Everybody um, at California Theatre. People go to generalmagicthemovie.com? There is, today is the last day in which you can enter for a competition. Uh, we're running it with... Well, unfortunately, this is going to air August 3rd. Oh! So only the people watching live. If you can travel back in time. <laughs> well, there are some people actually, watching live. No, I, do something. I actually have a suggestion, oh, yeah. which is there is another screening on August 3rd at the Computer History Museum. Run. Don't wait. Don't yes. walk. So, Get down. Um, yeah, so and see it if you can, because this is really good. And it's free. Yeah. Uh, so, nice. yeah. So the Computer History Museum is a, it's a free screening on the on August third. And if I have a dream, it may not be your dream. I would love to see Netflix pick this up so that everybody can see this because it really is exactly the movie that that it, it's it fits it. If if people kind of have a vision of how Silicon Valley works, it fills in this blank that I don't think anybody understands. This is a really interesting subject for me. Sarah Karush and uh, Matt Maud are the creators, uh, along with a third person we'll talk about in a second, of a new documentary about 
The most important Silicon Valley company no one ever heard of, is John Scully's words, it's General Magic. So I, we've talked a little bit about the movie itself, but I kind of want to talk about make, the making of the movie itself and how, what was the genesis of this? Well, I, had, I was in Italy. In fact, I was reading that book. The, the, the Walter, Jobs book? Yeah, the Walter Isaacson yeah. book. I was in Italy. We always have Steve, just, I don't know how that's happened, but he's just always peering over, us. peering over the... And I guess that's not inappropriate. <laughs> no, no, I love it. I love the fact that he's, he's there. Yeah. So I was reading the book, and I'm, I'm thinking, oh, Andy, and oh, Joanna, and Tony, and... That you was, knew all these people. I did, but it, that was the moment when it all crystallized for me, and I, and I thought, oh, this is history now. Yeah. And then, um, as I mentioned earlier, a really good friend of all of us um, died very tragically. Tragically, a magician called Sarko Dra Dragon Each, and um, then that was sort of the the spark. And I called my friend Mike Stern, who was the general counsel of General Magic, and he'd actually written a treatment for a book and sold it to I think Simon and Schuster for quite a lot of money. And then the board wouldn't actually let him write the book, so he'd been dying to tell this story. And I called him up and said, "Hey, Mike, I've been I've been sort of mulling this over and thinking about you know we should we should actually make a film about this." And Mike said, "Yeah, what do we do?" Um, so that was Mike. That was Musketeer Number One. And then I was looking for someone. I have a. I work at, in tech, so I have. I work in startups, so I have a very full time life and three kids. So I knew I couldn't do this by myself. And just by sheer luck, I was introduced to uh, Matt. We met at the um, Tate Modern in London. We were set up basically, essentially, uh, like a blind filmmaker's date. <laughs> and um, and we just hit it off like right from the myth. Right, it was just the spark was there. And I don't know, how do you know that you can trust somebody with something as important as this? How do you know? I, I don't know, but I did know. And so we set off on this, um, what became a three-year adventure to make the film. Wow. And Matt is the most astonishing collaborator in every dimension. He's extremely creative, um, wonderfully talented, creates community wherever we go, and is very forgiving of my ridiculously busy life. So <laughs> we... Um, yeah, it's been the making of the film for the most part, with a few little bumps, was um, pure joy. Matt, you don't have a, you said, a technical background. You're a filmmaker. I am. What attracted you to this story? Uh, I think watching through the archival footage, uh, there's a scene where it's a software meeting and they're all sat on the floor and they're wearing these terrible Christmas sweaters, pullovers. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, looking around the face of all these 20-somethings, and you're like, that's the guy that created LinkedIn, that's the guy that created eBay, that's the guy that created Android. For me, I was, I was immediately intrigued as to what were the ingredients of this company that were installed in these people, and what was learnt there. Because it's almost like a high school where every single person that went to that high school went on to be a success. Um, so, so there was that element. Um, and then, I think secondly, was is that as a filmmaker, you you want to try and tell a story that is filled with different emotions. And this was a very rich canvas to make a film that, that contained a lot of emotions because, you know, the, the excitement of building something and working with your tribe, with people that you've finally discovered, that energy of pure creation is amazing to see. You but recognise something in these startup kids that, that matched what you did as a filmmaker. Yeah, oh, very much so. Yeah. You, you know, the, the parallels with us making the film with them making the product yeah. it was, you know... Very like similar, yeah. A lot of, a lot yeah. of late night, you know, like yeah. working and working and working. But also, you know, you know, as Sarah was saying, you know, you know failure is, is a form of grief and getting over that is, is incredibly hard. And, you know, for us to be able to try and tell a story that conveys those emotions while also finding a catharsism to yeah. it. There's um, actually a great arc in this because it starts with hope and, and excitement and you're going to change the world. Then it's, you know, you go through the process, you, 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 the you hero's journey. the valley of the doom. And, yeah. and, then, and then the disaster and then the light at the end where you realize, but we did it. Yeah, and that was very much, you know, when I when I first started working on the film, uh, Sarah said to Mike and I, we, sh we need to script it as if it's a fiction film. Yeah. And so we need to find, you know, we're yeah. going to, this is going to be a three act film and it's going to have a narrative spine. So you and, wrote a script for yeah. it? Yeah. And so, you know, we kind of wrote almost 30 scenes of what the film would oh, follow. And it meant that when we sat down and did the interviews, you were looking for these stories, these right. little scenes that would kind of connect yeah. to be able to put together, you know, a, a call to adventure and then, you know, a compelling second act and then a, you know, a, a down 
downward part of the second act and then hopefully a redemption in right. the third. So yeah, we, we did, I think when you're making a documentary, it really helps to have that spine and you can change, you know, as you're making well, a documentary, uh, it should be able to be yeah, changed. Yeah, often in a documentary, you don't know where you're going to end No, up, right? but you still need that thing because otherwise you, you're making a thousand films at once. Yeah, yeah. So that really helps and Sarah's amazing for that. So you had, you, you had a kind of a beginning because, it, and you were there, Sarah, at the beginning when Andy had brought mm -hmm. in a filmmaker it's really interesting that Andy Hertzfeld, I think it was Andy that did it because he introduces the filmmaker, right? Was it Andy or Mark? Actually, I think it was Mark Pratt. Yeah, well, so, okay. so David Hoffman um, made films with Mark Pratt. They made ah. uh, they made a TV series for PBS called The Information Society because Mark, in addition to, you know, basically having the vision for the smartphone and many other things that we use today, also understood that the next sort of phase of economic development and uh, societal development was the information society and right. they made this fantastic I remember it, it was series. very good yeah. yeah so David made that and then uh, Mark brought him in when you know and partly because what they were envisaging there was no comparison right so they wanted to use film to tell or right. to capture what it is and why it was exciting and why people should care about what they were doing there's a Tracy Kidder was brought in when uh, in the soul of the new machine it was one of the great books of, of uh, technology because he was embedded in effect at Data General as they invented a new mm. computer and then got a great book out of it. So I'm, I'm sure that Mark was aware of that notion of having an embedded team to record. And and that also gives you some sense of how important, how he believed, I'm sure, this is going to change the world and you're going to want a document of how we did it. Yeah, and it's extremely rare when you think about it. And yeah. one of the, one I wish of it happened more often. Yeah. Exactly, and one of the most astonishing aspects of the entire journey, talking about how we made the film, was we had two moments where we knew we had this original cache of footage, but there were two moments where we discovered two, one enormous um, stockpile of footage in Hawaii, 600 tapes, and then another uh, smaller, but perhaps even more important. Yeah, definitely. Piece. I mean, we'd almost finished editing the film when the second order footage came in. <laughs> um, and there was there were whole scenes that we'd imagined in our minds. But you didn't have. That we didn't have. And then here they were. Oh. And I mean, I, I certainly wept on, on a few occasions because, you know, you have this in your mind. You think, you know, oh, that, that moment when they did that thing and then to have it. I mean... I still dream about the footage and I still want to sit down in the editing room and just make sure that we have used every single of the best shots we have. that we have. We have. <laughs> no, I mean, it's... Matt did it, all right. <laughs> he just wants it's, to um, it We... When you're kind of making a film that's so much about archival footage, the way I kind of describe it is, is you're you're trying to solve a crime that never happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we'd you know be pouring through these photographs, and then you'd see someone in the back of the photograph holding like a, a stills camera. Yeah. And so you'd be, who's that person? We need to get you know the the picture that they took. And then that suddenly led to someone having a video camera in in the back of the footage. And then we got in contact with that person and said, you don't by any chance still wow. have the tapes. And wow. that that one tape that Sarah is referring to it's 45 minutes in length and that that did completely change the film what the is first, what part what is that it's um Bill Atkinson uh bought a video camera from Japan yeah and he the footage that he was recording was of his friends but shot by him oh. and that is uh, that dynamic is completely different to say the footage that you shot with David Hoffman because it's friends shooting friends mm. yeah. and that awkwardness is much more you know it reveals character yeah and it makes up the first 30 minutes of the film we we use so much i gotta from watch that the tape. film again now <laughs> one of the things that's interesting there's so much found footage and it's uh, there's so it's really beautifully put together thank you and and uh well for instance you have a, a lot of interview with john scully and, and mm -hmm. we were talking uh but during the break sarah about how surprised you were with that conversation and how interesting he was uh and you lead it off with i don't know where you found this footage of him lifting weights in the gym and at first i'm thinking to, is he is this contemporary is he but then you show a, a robicize uh, thing which clearly with the leggings i knew that this was uh, this was found footage where did you get that that was from a TV show that the BBC recorded, <laughs> a BBC Horizon show. Oh, but that's one of my favourite. That's and that hysterical. Was, I mean, we, it's, it's weird because at the time it would have been very serious, but watching it, you it's know, not. like 20 years <laughs> later, it's just, it is really it's funny. It's got a lovely comic. There's comic some bits in there. I mean, like with the bit with John at the gym made sense. There's a bit where John is at his house riding around in a little horse and cart. Oh, why did you use cart. that? Because he, I mean, it it's, can't. It would have broken this. The whole, character is, yeah. you know, it's we we felt like we were just on the edge in the gym. <laughs> you needed that. This would have been that would have been, you know, like and now we go to the CEO of Apple riding his horse. You know, like um, so. But I mean, the metaphor of you know, like 
you know, going around in a circle yeah. on this horse and mm-hmm. cart. It was mm-hmm. just... I don't think I ever saw that. That's yeah. hysterical. So how much of it was the original footage? Were, was that the backbone of the, of the film? Is it, the footage that you some, shot? Certainly some very key scenes came yeah. from that, that there's, footage. There's a fabulous very revelatory uh, moment with Megan Smith where she's Mm. so young and she's got all the prototypes and she's pulling them out and then to think of her and see her later as the CTO of the United States and it's wonderful to see to have those juxtaposed is amazing and I'm so glad you have that footage Mm. of a very young Megan Smith joyfully Oh, and she hasn't changed a bit. It's the same yeah. enthusiasm, yeah. the same just glee. Um, and that great line when they say, and how small is it finally going to be, Meg? And she said, one day it's going to be like a Dick Tracy wristwatch. And, and what? And you, no. But you can hear the filmmakers laugh. Yeah. You, can, you can hear yeah. them like gasp. Never. They're just like, yeah. <laughs> little And of course, kid. another person who uh, was at General Magic, Lynch. Mm. Uh, what's his first name? I can't remember his first name. Peter Which? Lynch. Lynch. Kevin. Oh, Kevin, Kevin Lynch. Lynch. Kevin. Is now in charge of Apple Watch. Uh, and the list goes on. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Kevin, so, uh, Kevin. I thought for a second that, that was David Lynch there. It was like another David person. Lynch was the not general there. Magic. I don't David believe Lynch. Was but Peter, but okay. Kevin Lynch was. He, of course, went yeah. on to do Dreamweaver and worked at Adobe. Mm. And then famously, Apple hired him. And was he was kind of the enemy and brought into mm. Apple and ended up running Watch. And, and yeah. Kevin is one of the loveliest people yes. that I've He's ever met. Yeah. And so talented. And as you said, and Megan, you know, Megan's gone on to bring all of those lessons into government. And yeah. while I recognize as a hiatus right now in terms of, you know, a progressive, <laughs> scientific, technologically advanced government, um, that, you know, I think those seeds have been so oh, yeah. for a different way for oh, yeah. the government to engage. Well, and it's with- funny because I did, I've known her as a, a, a VP at Google and mm-hmm. then later CTO. I had no idea that she was a mechanical engineer who had worked on the prototypes yeah. uh, of the magic. Uh, what it, so this, the other st- side of the story that's interesting is that very early on, Mark decided to partner with some very big companies. Uh, you mentioned Sony and mm-hmm. Motorola right. and od- oddly Panasonic mm-hmm. en- yeah. enemies. Yeah. Uh, and, and all of them, and, and most importantly perhaps AT&T, mm-hmm. all of them bought into the vision that Mark was selling of this new communication device. But it, in kind of tragically, AT&T turned out to be a mistake because it led them down a different path. The internet was coming. Mm. Yeah. And that's, re- if, if there's one thing that, there's two things that really killed, in my opinion, killed General Magic. One was that, that they did a proprietary network with AT&T instead of using what was going to be the internet. Now it was early, so that's, you know, it's hard when you're that early. Yeah. Definitely, I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. They were they were early. They were too they were too early. And if you think if they were if they'd started three years later with the internet, yeah, it may have worked. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and the second thing that killed them was the betrayal of their parent company, Apple, and John Scully, who the he's on the board at General Magic the whole time they're working on their product. Apple's secretly working on Newton. I would say I would say that that's a bit of a red herring from my perspective. I certainly think from a dramatic point of view that's an interesting sort of twist in the tale. But I would say the second thing that killed them was uh, the thing that made them great. And it's that fine line between self-belief and hubris. Yeah. When you yeah. you so believe in what you're doing that you can't step out of it and really question. Yeah. Some people did for sure. I mean, John G. Andrea, who is now you know head of AI at Apple, famously went to Mark and said, you know, we really this is where the this is where things are heading. And he knew the internet was was here. He, he yeah. knew, and he yeah. left very early for that reason because mm-hmm. we couldn't make that pivot. And there was also a. a an intern who would said, hey guys, look at this, look at this internet thing, this is really going to be big. Um, it but was, I, uh, General Magic was not far from the only company that missed the <laughs> no, internet. That fam- very famously, Microsoft did as well. Yeah. But not so tragically, unfortunately. Yeah. And even John Scully says, yeah. well, you know, we could have yep. could have been a little bit more uh, clever. But it required that, 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 um, that cold-heartedness of someone to come in and say, this mm-hmm. is the new direction, they may have supported us, they may have funded us, but we're no longer going to work with this company. But that's hard, you know, that's that's a betrayal in itself. You, you very much get a sense watching this, it was the inmates running the asylum. Mm-hmm. <laughs>
Well, Which like, is not a bad thing. These are great inmates. And they were great, and they were so, and it's the creativity. I mean, they were just you love them. They were artists. And but they, Andy Hertzfeld himself said, "I wasted yes. too much time uh, making little things dance and yeah. not." <laughs> yes, <laughs> I was, felt guilty. Actually, you know, we, during the course of the interviews, I can't remember who it was that we were speaking uh, spoke to about it, but they said it's it is the Lost Boys. It's you know yeah. it, there is a Never Neverland yeah. about it. You know th there wasn't a parent around saying, "Hey, we should maybe not do this. Let's just do this." Let's not do a thousand things. Let's just do a hundred things. I would also say, though, that that really, you know, that sort of 90s culture of tech development really led to how we develop now because there was this sort of, you know, you, you do tons of things but on tons of features. You take two years and then you take it to market, right. you know, which was catastrophic, not just in General Magic's case, but in many companies' cases. And that really changed the way that we do development today, which is why Agile exists. It's like, you know... Mm. Bit at a time. Bit at a time, test it. Is Most, that working? Yeah, you know, minimum viable product, then the next generation. Mm -hmm. But that's the. But, but this was the model Macintosh had used, right? Exactly. We're going to all yeah. get you in a building, and you're going to kill yourselves yeah. for three years, <laughs> and then magically yeah. a product will pop out. Yeah. yeah. And it worked for the Mac. Yeah. Well, it was it was touch and go for a Actually, while, it didn't, though. Yes. I mean, they had very poor have. sales for a long time, and yeah. it, lots of things didn't work, and it was that's too expensive. Yeah. And yeah. I, it's funny though, because when we were at Tribeca, uh, one of the questions that got asked was, well, you know, what what is so amazing about these engineers? What makes someone like Andy Hertzfeld or Bell Atkinson so great? And I. I I, I said that if, if you imagine that the memory disk that was inside of the, the Magic Cap device was a megabyte, and you're thinking about how many apps were put onto this storage, how much was in the RAM, it, it, it just it's mind-boggling yeah. that they tried to do as much as they mm -hmm. could with so little, mm -hmm. and that those engineers knew how to just you know take so much out of kilobytes. Right. Whereas now, if you were an engineer at Apple or at Google, you would just laugh. You know, yeah. it's, it's... Well, they it's, had resistance, resistive touch. It, they had a very low resolution, if you look at the animated... Everything. Graphics, the Susan You know, they were, just, they were just squeezing it out, like yeah. every single last drop. Yeah. And I think that's what made them such incredible engineers. But if you think, you know, five years later, ten years later, you know, what they would have been able to do with real storage and, and real memory and real RAM, it's... it's so amazing. is that really the, the bottom line, is they were just ahead of their time? I think so. And and then you do have to be mindful that being able to, in any endeavor, you need to be a believer and you also need to be able to look, take a hard look at what's working and yeah. what's not working. Yeah. Um, you know, we haven't talked about Ruben in this respect, Andy Ruben. You know, obviously, he, he's another person who learned those lessons at General Magic. What was his role when he joined General Magic? He was an engineer. He was fairly um, young. I would Was this um, his first job? He used to keep his Ferrari in my garage. That's really what the main thing <laughs> That I remember about Where did he get the Ferrari? <laughs> he, he was always doing these crazy pranks, you know, convincing, you know, basically, I think, as I remember, he convinced the Grand Cayman Islands that he was their Minister of Information and represented himself as such for many years. It was he, some crazy... He went, he went sharesies on the Ferrari. My, that was my recollection. Yes. He bought it with several people uh -huh. so they could, yes, they could all did. drive it around, I think, oh, on dates, funny. right? Yeah, something oh, like that. Oh, my. Um, but they yeah, were, I mean, he were. he would you know like he would take apart fax machines just to work out how they would work, and then would take part of like their mechanisms and put them into the magic device. Oh, he's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man. You know, and he's so interested with robotics. You know, yeah. Android kind of comes from yeah. all that. So, yeah, just just amazing people. I think this so, movie could have been four times longer, couldn't it? Because <laughs> I'm thinking there's there. I, I would like to no. see more of the Andy Rubin story yes. too. You know? Yeah. It's interesting for me because uh, I'm with not being a part of Silicon Valley. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a tiny little village in the middle of the Yorkshire Dales, so this was like a billion miles away from from where I kind of grew up. When you look at like huge tech companies, they're personified by one person, and still, you know, to this day, Apple is still kind of personified by this ghost of Jobs, Facebook, Zuckerberg, yep. te Tesla with Musk. For me, it was really interesting that you when you're working or working on a film like General Magic and you're seeing all these engineers, that they are incredibly ordinary people, special in their own way, yeah. but they are ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Yeah. And that's, you know, some of the joy is, is, is finding out those stories about like Andy Rubin's pranks and Tony mm -hmm. Fidel, like, you know, turning up and just being the punk of the office, <laughs> you know, like this weird, like university student that they had he was there. A, he was so young. Yeah. So, so that's funny because Sarah and I grew up with this as mythology. This is our, these are the fables of our, uh, you know, our generation. Yeah. But not for you. I mean, I was, I was seven. Yeah. I was seven at the time when you guys yeah. started filming. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh my goodness me. <laughs> he never uh, told you that part. Well, I've never actually done the math. Never I thought about alarming, that one. But I've never actually yeah. done the math. <laughs> We're talking about an amazing company, General Magic, that some of you may remember. Not a lot of people owned the Magic Link. They did eventually ship a product. <laughs> three, how many did they sell? 3,000, was it? 
Yeah, the, I, first, the first, yeah, the first quarter was like 3,000 people. They didn't, but you know, the people, they still work. People still love them. I have a bunch of Newtons in the back, but I don't have a Magic Link. Oh, well, I don't know if I bought one. I can't remember if I had one or not. I think I didn't because it was nine hundred dollars. They were expensive. Yeah, they well, were that expensive. was the, that was the rub. Ultimately, I think that was the other thing that killed them. Is the price point was just too high. Yeah. And it had to be because of the some of the parts, but nonetheless, it was too high for that yeah. time. Uh, I'm just gonna faux pas because you've commented. I hate when I want room. to see something and it's not out yet. Are you based in the Bay Area? Can you just? Let us know. Just type it to you. I don't think he is. Most of our viewers are not. And okay. so they won't be able to go. But if you get a chance, mm -hmm. August 3rd, mm -hmm. the, tomorrow, as we or today, actually, as we air this, we recorded it earlier, uh, you can go to the Computer History Museum and see it for free. Let's hope there's still some room. Or if people watching now, um, there's a few more seats for the premiere, the Valley premiere in San Jose. Because, nice. yeah, we're running a competition so, for that. So nice. if you... Will some of the people in the movie show up for that, do you think? Yeah. You should Sorry, come. Do you want to come and do an interview some of them? Come and it's the going to be a big night. Oh, it sounds fun. When is it? And next Thursday. Maybe I will. Six days from now. Yeah. We'll talk, we'll talk about it We uh, have a whole afternoon of press and people coming. Yeah, I'd like and to. It, I mean, there's going to be all We've kinds of... We've had uh, Bill Atkinson on this show many times. I've, mm -hmm. I, I knew Andy pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, of course, Waz is a friend, but uh, there's a lot of people that were in this movie I would love to well, meet. Well, Megan's going to be there for interviews. Yeah. Tony's going to be there. Yeah, I'd love to meet Tony. I'd love to meet Megan. Yeah, what a great... Well, we could arrange it. We could arrange it. bunch of people. Well, Carson, we'll have to think about that. I don't usually like to leave the building. You don't like to leave the... <laughs> <laughs> uh, there have been threats. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I said nice. before, we were in a break, Sarah, and I said, Sarah, I have to prepare you. I want to talk to you about a thing you probably won't get interviewed a lot about, your workflow. How do you do something like this? You too, Matt. How do you mm. do something like this? You have so much material. So you, you said you started with a script, which is interesting. I don't think that's common in documentary. Yeah. And it was a writer's room as well. Was uh, it really? Yeah. So interesting. Uh, Carrie Tallett, who's one of the co-producers of the film, she was also part of the story team. Yeah, when we first put it together, the, we... That's we, a very unusual way to do a documentary. Yeah, but it, I mean, you know, if you're, if you're looking at seeing how it works really well for TV, where everybody in the room has a voice yep. and everybody can comment on it. Um, and it oh, you know, had the same feeling that we kind of locked the door and had enough food there to kind of keep us going. And by then you had hundreds of hours of video? That was when we started. So we started with a writer's room and we said... Before yeah. you had any yeah. well, knowledge we knew of what you had. Uh, we had some footage. We had the archival footage. We'd, oh, yes. we'd already agreed yeah. to pre-license with David already... Hoffman. So yeah. we had probably, ooh, I'm going to say eight, six, six, seven, eight hours of footage. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, okay. That's a good But start. it was all... It had been shot, the stuff, that, that initial tranche of footage had been shot with the intention of being put into a, proposi a promotional package. And so this was what they were using at the New York launch, which is in the film, right. to kind of show all the alliance partners working on it. Right. So there was a lot of interviews with like the stuff CEOs of, well, yeah. it, you know, you, you take a line yeah. here or there, yeah. but we, the first, the way we rose the first round of finance is that we cut together like a, oh. an eight minute sort of teaser of the archival footage to show that there was a story potential there. Uh, and so, yeah, the way that we made the film is that we would edit, show that to investors, raise finance, go back and then shoot more, edit, show them the next sort of package and then raise more finance. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's the way we... I think people don't realise how expensive it is to do a documentary and how much of the job is really raising money uh, for the documentary. Yeah, it's weird. So, I've, I've worked on fiction films as well and it requires the same amount of man hours, people hours, um, as it does a fiction film. But in a documentary, you're doing it with less people. Right. So it takes longer. And uh, even more in the editing room, I would say. Oh, yeah, oh, definitely. Well, yeah, that's yeah. the other thing that's different here. Mm -hmm. You had the story. The story was is over, in a sense. <clears throat> yeah. So you, and you have the footage that you, you, you know, that any, any footage from then that exists, you're going to find other footage and do interviews. But... So you do kind of have somewhere to start. It wasn't going to be a surprise. The ending yes. wasn't a surprise. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't, yeah. <laughs> you know how it's going to end. But still you have to create a story, a compelling story. And not just a storyline, but visually too. That's always uh, difficult, especially, I don't, maybe Matt, you hadn't experienced this, but with technology, so much of it's abstract. Mm -hmm. that it's very hard. It's one of the reasons I hate doing tele technology television because you always have to provide pictures mm -hmm. and you get so many pictures of people moving a mouse and <laughs> silly mm -hmm. typing on a keyboard. You, you managed very nicely to avoid all of that. I thought it was really, it's, it's, a, it's actually a beautiful picture. There's a lot of uh, beauty, beauty shot, a lot of drone work in there too, Well, I right? would say, yeah, so we, that was, um, so Matt brought a level of sort of cinema to the piece. I, I always pretty. wanted to make something that was beautiful. Yeah. But Matt really facilitated yeah. that. Um, both he's got an, an extraordinary eye and also um, 
An extraordinary brother as An well. An extraordinary brother. Is he uh, the drone pilot? He's, he's the other cinematographer on the film. Uh, and then, yeah. uh, but the drone pilot's somebody very special. Called Steve Mailer, and he was a former magician. And, and he's famous now in the Valley for his drone yeah. work. Yeah, yeah. In fact, he does a lot of the portraits, photography portraits at Facebook. Um, but he came on and he was a really also an amazing addition to the team. Yeah. I mean, it was... Uh, there's, there's a lot of... Um, metaphors within nature about how failure iterates itself. Yeah, I think Paul Sappho did a really good yes, job describing the that. wave. Yeah. 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 And so, but we, you know, I, don't we, want, I feel like I, I don't, there's so many things I want to refer to, but I don't want to spoil the <laughs> film for people either. So I want them to see it. But, but uh, we, you know, John we also, Markoff and Paul Sappho are very nice. I, yeah. I think a good choice for kind of being the Greek chorus, exactly. explaining what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And Kara Swisher. Yeah, Kara's yeah, great. I'm glad somebody picked up on the Greek chorus. Yes, yeah. that was the yeah. idea. Um, yeah. But I mean, we, we also did culture. some filming of um, like the Redwood Forests. Yes, You know, we, we thought stuff. about that, yeah. you know, but it was actually the waves that the we waves thought was the strongest really metaphor yeah. Yeah. for yeah. it. And yeah. we, we did that. We had that idea before Sappho even said it. No kidding. And there was like, ding! And before Mark said it. Because Mark uses it too. Well, I think it's because I'd read the poem in his book. And that's where I could... Oh, so it was actually... Did you know the book existed, the Red Book? Uh, yes. Did we? Yeah, I, I mean, when I first came onto the project, the, the, the Red Book had been talked about because Mike, Mike oh, had... Right. But did you know that Mark still had it? No. that was that that's was, an amazing thing. He pulls yeah. it out. We were in the middle of the interview and he said, oh, and let me go get the no. Red Book. And yeah. he pulls out the Red Book. So that was... That was a definite eye opener. But it's, there's a there's two there's two assets that are online right now. There's a there's a teaser that's existed for nearly three years at generalmagicthemovie.com. There we are. And then there's a trailer that's only a week old. People should watch um, that. But the teaser uh, we did we did three days of interviews, and then I did fourth day with Steve doing drone photography, and we did we shot for maybe like six hours that day, and then that evening I came back and edited the, the teaser together, and then it went live the next day. Um, and it was it, it's it's Mark's poem, the original vision of what was Pocket Crystal, the the, the iPhone of 1989, uh, and then we set it to this um, footage that you know felt like it could be shot at any time. It's 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 got a kind of ethereal quality to it that it's almost you know the things that your iPhone allow you to do. It's not the iPhone, but it's the things that the iPhone allows you to do in terms of capturing rich photographs mm -hmm. and, and videos. And um, you know when it sets the right music, it it, it feels like the embodiment of what you could do with your smartphone um and so yeah it existed for quite a while as our as our teaser for the film so part of the fun and challenge of being a documentarian is not knowing what's going to happen next but mm -hmm. you knew were there still surprises in this as you're going i mean the oh, red books won yeah. Right? yeah yeah there were surprises all over the shop i mean it, you have to incredible. i mean even even with an archival documentary even with Finding say with a story the story oh yeah, yeah i mean there was just yeah. you know that is sarah like, you said that john scully was kind of a a revelation. a revelation. Yes, I was inclined not to like him. Um, Neither a, a, was I. <laughs> upon starting the interview. But <laughs> the man who fired Steve Jobs. Exactly. But I found him um, very, very present in his interview and really willing to talk about the hard things. Yeah. And not guarded and not walled. But he said, you know, it took him 17 years to get over his own personal failure was, you know, when he got fired from Apple. Um, and it was only really fairly recently that, that he got over it and was able no to really kidding. look at it. Wow. I mean, yeah, I mean, he, he talks about the devastation of failure as poignantly as Mark. Mm, the parallels between him and Mark are really interesting. You know, and in some ways, the things that John said about Mark, um, you know, we said to Mark, we're going to interview Scully, and he was like, oh, that's, well, what, what, do, you, what do you hope to get from that? And then we said, What's well, Mark's, what does Mark think of Scully? Was, well, was, I think there's a there's a widespread feeling of uh, still to this day of of magicians that, that you know that resentment. still feel very bitter about yeah. that betrayal. And then coupled with you know the the jobs firing, he's you know he's not a well liked guy across the valley. And so you know to to a person, it was why are you doing this? Why well, talk um, to him? Yeah, exactly. You know he's he's the enemy. He's the bad guy. You know, but he was the guy who wrote the check that got General Magic totally. off the ground. Yeah, I mean, if it, and, and still believed in it and wrote them beautiful still, notes and, when they when they launch the product and you know he's the one who I think brings the perspective of Mark's life that ultimately redeems Mark that here was somebody who was so great who really did imagine the future as as it is today um, I think that's I think you know, we, we really, Matt and I really believe that, you know, pe characters, people are very multidimensional. And we wanted to capture that. Not the all bad guy and the all good guy, but, you know, all the dimensions within all the main characters. And yeah, I it's think not that's fair something. to just make an antagonist. No. Because John isn't that, you no. know. Yeah. He's more complicated. And yeah. uh, in, in our case, he was, um, 
just uh that was a mind-blowing interview it was yeah because we 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 walked in with you know this this was a courtesy um and that we wanted to get his side of the story but we, we were blown away by it he has in recent years i think and it's partly age. That's one of the stories of this, by the way. Yes. It's a little disappointing because I'm as old as these guys are. And it's like, oh, yeah, this is all history now. This, yeah. this feels so recent to me. This feels like uh, a part of the, you know, the timeline we're all in. And it's not. It's, it's history now. And, uh, and John is older. And but I think that that age has given him some perspective that actually is really valuable and some wisdom. And I know wisdom. he's helping a lot of other CEOs. He's very involved. I'm yeah. very involved in the health tech space, and um, he, so he's he plays a very important role yeah. in that. A rainmaker. Good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So what did we learn? What did we learn from all of this? What is the moral of the story? I'd love to think that I think for me it's two things. One is learning to speak about the hard things and the failures and the things you don't do well or the things you don't do right is actually uh, a really important step in being able to get to the next level of whatever it is you're trying to do. It's, it's, a, it's a power, it's like a, a special power that you get when you're really willing to look at something and it's painful and it's hard, but you can talk about it and you own up to it and you own your part in it. I think it sets you free in a very profound way. I think that's one thing. And the second thing for me is, for me, I like to think of it as I wanted to make a manual for how you can bring, what it takes to bring big ideas to life and what you can expect. So if you're going to go on this journey, you can expect to meet the two-headed hydra, um, hmm. you know, along the way and um, and it's going to hurt and this is what you're going to need to do. And so you're going to meet incredible obstacles. You're going to you come up against the very limit of your own ability and your endurance. Um, at the end of the day, sometimes all it takes is um, all that you, the, the, the ultimate thing that's required is nothing except persistence just to keep going and these lessons are ones that are very very personally important to me and i think you know as it relates to anyone who's trying to bring a, an idea to life whether it's a technology or a product or a book or a movie it's understanding that it's a path and it's never straightforward and it's never easy if you're trying to do something important or hard mm -hmm. but at the end of the day it's worth it and just keep going. And if you, your idea failed the first time, but you still feel passionately about it, try and find a different way. And so, and you know, and for me now that these lessons are incorporated in my work, I work for a company called Chiron Medical and we're working in the AI radiology imaging space on um, products that detect cancer earlier. And so, you know, I, I feel like I have the, this wonderful sort of, um, these lessons from history, recent history, but that inform everything I do every single day mm -hmm. about how we how we do this. What are the things that are going to be hard, and then how do we um, how do we how do we keep going? So this really fundamental idea of cancer detection and making it, uh, you know, for example, in breast cancer, making sure that we detect cancer earlier and and that we develop better cancer treatments because we can track cancer better. You know, those are the things that um, they just they're with me every single day. And I, I would love to think that if people watch the film, that they'll be able to take a little bit of that away with them and take it into something that they think is important that they're trying to do and maybe isn't going so well, or maybe they're too afraid to try it, or maybe it's just they're in that sort of long valley of doom phase of the project. But just keep going because that's how ultimately things get made yeah. mm. and ideas are born. I think for me... That's uh, a very long answer, sorry. No, but, it's a great answer. Thank you. Um, and it, this was very much mirrored making the film uh, while also seeing it at General Magic is, is that it's it's not enough to love the thing that you're making. And you have to. You have to, f you have to love the thing that you're creating. But you... you you have to do it with uh, people that you love making it mm. with, and those those two things are have to run in parallel. I mean, you know, it's been a joy making this film with Sarah and the rest of the team because, you know, day in day out, even in the hardest struggles, you're doing it with people that you love and uh, that you kind of get through that stuff together. And when we were making the film, you know, walking through the corridors of Google or uh, seeing engineers at Apple or Sarah and I filmed the last week of the Obama administration. And when you're seeing people like that, that are dedicated to a cause that they believe in passionately, but they're also surrounded by people that are as passionate as they are, that's unstoppable. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, if, you, if you've got people that can also be looking at the downsides yeah. and, you know, expressing their doubts and, you know, having that, that hubris and that humility, then yeah the the problems that we are facing in the world are mm -hmm. conquerable um, well thank you for this great movie i i really enjoyed it and the end you, of the movie where you see all the people that were there and what they've done 
since really underscores how important General Magic was, even though it's the most important company no one's ever heard of. <laughs> I thank you. I'm glad you brought it. Uh, you brought it a little bit back for uh, all of us, and I think people should uh, go to General Magic the movie. Find out where there's a screening that they can go to if there's not one near you. I'm sure there will be soon, and knock on wood, distribution will make it easy for everybody to see it because it really is worth it. It's awesome. a great bit of history. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a great Cheers. pleasure. Sarah Karush and Matt Maud, thank you so thank much for joining us. us. Cheers. We do triangulation uh, normally every Friday around 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. We did this one uh, pre-record a little earlier because, of course, Sarah and Matt are in town for their big screening coming up. Uh, but you can always tune in 3 p.m. Pacific, uh, 6 p.m. Eastern, uh, 2200 UTC, twit.tv slash live on Fridays to see what we're doing. We introduced uh, some of the most interesting uh, people in technology uh, to this uh, to this show, and it's uh, it's so much fun to do it. Uh, come back and uh, watch. If you can't watch live, you can always watch on demand. We have audio and video of our shows available at twit.tv, in this case, twit.tv slash TRI, or you can subscribe in your favorite podcast application. You can also listen on your smart device. Just ask for a triangulation. You'll get the latest episode. Listen to Triangulation. That's a That works on almost every device out there. Uh, and for those of you listening in airplanes, I hope you'll come to the website, twit.tv slash TRI, and find some more great shows. I think you'll enjoy them. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Triangulation. Bye-bye.